Hello, I'm Jenny Klochko. I'm in Kyiv today, and my guest used to be the head of all Ukrainian spy. He used to be the head of defense intelligence, the head of counterintelligence, and he's one of the most educated and experienced men in his profession, Valery Kondratyuk. Hello. Hi. Slava Ukraini. Heroem Slava. Uh, Pane Valeriu, two years of war. Two years of war, murder, or shall we say death, uh, the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. How would you comment on the situation? What's going on? What should we expect during this new year of war? Possibly some historical analysis? What should we prepare for? На жаль, склалася ситуація, коли сьогодні на фронті ми дійсно Україна вимушена зв'язку з не Unfortunately, on the front line, Ukraine lacks the ammunition and weapons on which we rely on from our partners, and we must change the strategy. It is best to say strategic deterrence of our enemy. During 2024, there will not be any dramatic changes. So we will try to destroy as many Russians as possible to stop them from capturing more territories. At the same time, we will grow our capabilities. However, the main war will be regarding the secret services and diplomacy. It will be on the global stage. The second front line opened by Ukraine on the Russian territory using the tactics of the Thousand Cuts will be increasing. We estimate that our drone sanctions proved to be more effective than the sanctions in the offices of Eurobureaucrats and the leaders of other European countries. It will have a significant meaning, the death of the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. This tragic event raised new anti-Putin wave, and the consequences of this wave will be surprising for Russia. We must try to make Ukraine the provider of internal changes inside Russia. I think that the Russian regime crossed the line, and Putin became a dictator like Stalin was, who destroys his opponents. Putin уже став диктатором на шкал Сталіна, який знищує своїх опонентів. Тобто, якщо ми казали про другу світову війну, що це був фашизм, при комунізмі був там. When we were talking about World War II, it was fascism. During the Soviet times, it was communism. Today. We see a new wave of genocide called Russism. It is a combination of fascism and communism. Putin became a true Russism of Stalin's ideology, which destroyed the Ukrainian people and the rest of the countries and individuals who had their views about their future. You are saying the death of the Russian opposition leader raised the wave? It looks like this wave is more external than internal. We are expecting an uprising among the Russian people. For now, it looks like those who are brave enough to demonstrate their grief are getting arrested, and they are getting punished as much as possible. The West should understand today that the long path begins with the first step. Russian civil society is under the propaganda influence. Just one example. Ten years ago, Russians did not consider Ukrainians as their enemies. But today, they are brainwashed and think Ukraine is their enemy and want to destroy it. If we change the narrative, then we can influence the Russians. The next step from the West should be soft and firm simultaneously. Russian opposition should be united. The first step towards their victory has been done in Ukraine. Fighting units were formed in Ukraine with Russian citizens, and volunteers joined daily in this unit. 
these guys did that raid on Belograd from the territory of Ukraine. It scared Putin very much, because the front line, 360 kilometers, is not the only collision line. It is the whole of Ukraine's border with Russia, and that is 2,500 kilometers. Today, the front line moved to the Russian territory. Khodorkovsky, the Russian opposition leader, says, to beat Putin with voting and to raise your hands is impossible. It is necessary to be prepared for the armed fighting. So the armed units are already organized in Ukraine. It's their units. Think of Prigozhin's march to Moscow. Russian people met him with flowers. There were protesting moods in Russia. It's up to us how we can spread this around. I know that the BBC Russian service increased their coverage in Russia by 19%. It means that Russian people strive towards truth, not the lies that flood all of Putin's media. It means that the British government should give more support to it. Putinskich kanalev, a do pravda. I to znaczy, że dzisiaj Urząd Brytanii ma podtrzymywać zbliżenie takich rzeczy. Ja думаю, że jednym czerwonym projektem możemy mieć wspólny projekt. There could be a new project based on joint efforts, Voice of Russia from Ukraine. We could invite Russian presenters like Nevzorov and Avsennikova and start the coverage of international events, explaining to the Russians where truth differs from the official Russian propaganda. That's what will be most crucial next year. I taki krok, mnie zdaje się, będzie dużo ważliwym w następnym roku. Ви знаєте, справа в тому, що люди, яких от журналісти ви згадали, вони викликають дуже багато негативу в Україні. Це по-перше. По-друге, do you know the names you mentioned have a negative perception of Ukrainian society? It doesn't look like Russians want and need this information. Overall, Putin is still extremely popular among young and old generations. We must remember, it is the country with Tsar, then the leader, now the modern version of Tsar. There are no signs that Russia is preparing for something new. It's not like Ukraine, which is in short term, had the Orange Revolution and then the Revolution of Dignity, Freedom and Independence in Ukrainian DNA. Що є оцей, знаєте, як в Україні, у нас була помаранчева революція, у нас була революція гідності. Ми люди, в яких незалежність, воля, вона у нас, ну, вона у нас зашифрована в ДНК. Женя, я з вами можу погодитись і не погодитись. I can agree and disagree with you simultaneously. Has the West ever expected that the Soviet Union will collapse? Is anybody from the Western Secret Service expecting this to happen? Nothing was inside the society. Every dissident movement was crushed and destroyed. However, when it eventually happened, the Ukrainians were happy, as were the other republics of the Soviet Union. Чому? Тому що критичний розум навіть тих спецслужбістів, путінських кагібістів, які сьогодні там дійсно серед них є переконані патріоти, вони розуміють, що ця війна веде до знищення Росії. It might be invisible from the outside, but it does not mean it is not brewing inside. Even Putin's inner circle realized that this war would destroy Russia. It leads to the economic decline. They are running out of their safety cushion. All the Russian assets should be transferred to Ukraine for reconstruction and the war effort. Even in Germany's anti-war movement during World War II, when Hitler had just started the war, about 900,000 Germans were arrested and 140,000 were destroyed. Do you know how many assassination attempts Hitler had? It was 18 attempts. I think knowing how the British people stood alone against Hitler in Europe is essential. How many assassination attempts did Putin have? Why? Lack of professionals? Справа в тому, що система диктаторів, вони там вибудовуються таким чином, що дійсно сьогодні дуже складно. І побачили ви бачили ці The dictator system is organized to make it very difficult. Have you seen those long tables behind which he hides from the European politicians? And then we see how he is hugging people somewhere during his trips around the country. 
It's hilarious and surprising. It's how the systems of doubles works. We never know where the real Putin is. It means they have fake news and a fake president. Remember this. What happens with Putin's nearest circle? All they care about is the elections. You must understand that his inner circle of support is a bunch of Kremlin oldies, the same as him. They are just trying to prolong their existence, nothing more. As soon, Putin will never be safe. His physical, not political death will be the problem-solving decision and the safety net for Russia itself. Ukraine is waiting for a decision from the US. What are your predictions and expectations? Soldiers on the front line say that they are running out of ammunition and Ukraine lost Avdiivka. I would like to say that this is precisely what Putin is banking on. He is trying to push it to the American elections. He is waiting for Trump, who is going to destroy NATO and stop the ammunition supply to Ukraine. I know that American leaders understand supporting Ukraine is not only for the safety of the whole world, but it is also a matter of safety for the US. If you allow me, I'll tell you one exciting story. A long time ago I was training for an anti-terror course at Quantico. One of our instructors was a legendary person in the security circles. He was the head of Reagan's personal security service as president. His name was Jerry Parr. We had a chance to talk to him, and he was asked about Reagan's assassination attempt at the beginning of the 80s. Reagan was shot at the hotel during his lunchtime. Jerry told us it was challenging because he was head of Reagan's security service. He delivered the president via a safe route to the military naval hospital. When Reagan walked into the surgery theatre, he asked only one thing. I hope you are all Republicans. The surgeon replied, Mr. President, you have nothing to worry about today. We are all Republicans. Today, the whole world should say, and both houses of Congress, Republican and Democrats, should say, today we are all Ukrainians. When you were working at the president's office, you met Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken. Publicly, it looks like they are faithful friends of Ukraine. Do you share this impression of them? Will they help Ukraine in this challenging time when Congress yet to vote? Why did Western secret services get it wrong during the first days of the war? And will Ukraine fall in three days? Russians did those calculations as well. They relied on it more than Ukrainians' capabilities. They considered the ammunition, armoured vehicles, the number of brigades, and Ukraine's loss according to it. If they asked the question differently, what would we do so that Ukraine would not fall in three days? In that case, it would not be the question of several javelins and stingers for the partisan war. The question is whether they should support the development of new opportunities to defend Ukraine because our spirit and our bravery will prevail over Putin's army.
З вами тут не можна не погодитися. Але є той фактор, і він такий дуже потужний, про те, що війна – це десь там. Війна нас не стосується. Тому, наприклад, от коли за два тижні до повномасштабного вторгнення… I agree, but we must recognize there's always the feeling that war is somewhere there. It doesn't affect us. It is way too peaceful, friendly and comfortable in Europe. It is the new reality we are all trying to get used to. Ці самі люди от в цей момент, коли були вибухи і ракети, вони вже збирали і ми всі вчимося, розумієте? Це війна, мені здається, занадто довго в Європі було мирно, добре, затишно. І ну от і це якась нова реальність, до якої ми намагаємося звикнути. Це не нова реальність. Це, знаєте, як кажуть, інертність системи. It's not the new reality. It's a system's inertia, which made money on business with Russia. And even today, they don't want to stop doing it. And everything moves very slowly, regardless of the sanctions. Companies should find new markets. Today it's still a severe struggle. These people should be aware of what Russians do in Ukraine, all those crimes and cruelty. You cannot be indifferent if you are a human being. Returning to Mr. Blinken, I know there's a touching story about his family during his visit to Ukraine. Please tell me about it. Ну, насправді це не є якась темниця, тому що коріння, своїм корінням там дійсно там Ентоні Блінкін походить з України. It's not a secret. Anthony Blinken's family is coming from Ukraine. We wanted to do something unique and to have a warm relationship with the people. So we tried to find information about his roots in Ukraine. The only thing we knew was that the family was in the Perialslav Helmitsky community. We had no traces of it in our archives until we discovered the archives of the Jewish community. We found the record of the marriages and births of his relatives, and based on that information, we prepared a unique album for him to show our respect. I was told by American diplomats that he was very touched. Ben Wallace. Були чутки, що це колишній секретар з безпеки Британії, і коли були спекуляції про те, що буде вторгнення, починається війна. Бен Волес, former UK defense secretary, there was gossiping that he was ready to send ammunition to Ukraine long before the full-scale invasion. I know you met him during your work. What were your impressions and what was his role? As a Ukrainian living in the UK, he's my hero. I'm endlessly grateful. The people told me from Ukraine's general staff that he was always straight to the point and was like Santa with a bag full of presents. They did not need to ask him what they needed. It was all there. Все, що треба, розуміє все на півпогляду. Розкажіть про ваші враження. А, я, дякую за запитання. Мені дуже, знаєте, приємно. He is so charismatic. His positivity is contagious. I was honored to meet him before the war in May 2021. We had a planned protocol meeting with the heads of the security sector. At that time, I was the head of foreign intelligence of Ukraine. When we talked about the challenges and if Russia was going to do it, We discussed that Putin had lost his chance to occupy Ukraine politically. Medvedchuk's party was disbanded, Russian TV channels were closed, and the most significant humanitarian catastrophe was about to happen in Crimea due to the water supply issues. All the Russian efforts to solve this problem failed. The water level in Crimea was about 12 to 13 percent. Putin was ready to consider using his army to achieve these political and diplomatic objectives. We thought that Putin was going to do another military training around Ukraine. When we discussed all these things, I was impressed by his leadership and understanding. On that day, Ben Wallace was going to meet other defense ministers, and he was going to discuss these questions. He was going to add it to the 2022 budget. Пригадайте тоді, коли Росія побудувала Керченський мост і зупинила судноплавство, хоча це було там, ну, внутрішнє море там України і Азовське там і Do you remember when Russia built the Crimean Bridge and stopped shipping? It was the internal waters of Ukraine, and Russia had blocked everything, Ukraine's exports, etc. 
in Britain under the leadership of Ben Wallace. That warship crossed the waters under the British flag. They ignored Russia's demands. There were provocations from the Russians, from fighter jets. They were ready to attack. And British sailors were ready as well. It's not only me, but all Ukrainian people and our armed forces were enormously proud. I, I cry whenever I think about it. Britain, Great Britain, becomes greater and returns to its glory. Britannia, Velika Britannia, stays the biggest Velika and returns to its glory. Thank you. And I want to say, just like Ben Wallace, Можливо, і там не багато людей знає там ще до його особистої участі підтримці України. Ben Wallace, uh, only a few people were aware of his involvement in supporting Ukraine, but he was a leader in this overall support. Of course, from Prime Minister Boris Johnson and all the British people. I, I want to send a message to him. Dear sir, there won't be a day in our country when we will forget your role, the role of the Brits and all those who supported Ukraine. We remember and are eternally grateful for future generations. We know our real friends when we are together during the hard times. Thank you. І відроджувати так, щоб не було втручання Росії. І ви неодноразово When you were the head of defense intelligence of Ukraine, it was the time to revive Ukraine's intelligence without Russian involvement. You mentioned the help from the CIA and MI6 before. So tell me more about it. And the tragedy of MH17 was a very significant moment. I remember that time I was working for the BBC and we made a film about it. It was shocking how quickly SBU, Ukraine's secret service, published interceptions confirming Russia's involvement. How did this help to establish new relationship? От, які вказували на те, що там є російські представники, що там є Росія. Розкажіть, будь ласка, саме про цей момент в контексті прокладення нових зв'язків і закладення фундації для секретної служби в Україні, яка, якою вона є зараз? Я не розкрию вам яких там великих таємниць, але що я хочу поділитися, ви знаєте. It's not a big secret, but I want to share them in Britain. God save the king. In Ukraine we say, God loves Ukraine. After the revolution of dignity in 2014, I was the head of the counterintelligence of Ukraine. We were determined to prove Russian involvement. As everyone said, there were no Russians in the east of Ukraine. Putin's propaganda claimed it was local civil defense units who protested against the Kyiv regime. It was hard for us to prove they were wrong. That is the moment when the unexpected appeared. We sent our agents to the Russian training camps in Crimea, then these people returned, and then we got technical opportunities to collect intelligence uh, about the Russian book hit, and the Russian service members behind it, and their commanders and the rest. Russia used the hybrid tools against Ukraine, then we got this evidence. The role of cooperation of our partners was vital. Why? Because there were pro-Russian politicians in Ukraine, and they appointed the top roles for national security people, intelligence and the secret service. Russia blocked all the operations. Professionals with a pro-Ukrainian patriotic approach were fired. By the end of the day, one of the critical positions in Ukraine was pro-Russian people. And any activity to find out about Russia's plans towards Ukraine was blocked. The West couldn't trust us. Russians used the territory of Ukraine for operations against Western countries, especially against the UK. They were sending illegal spies to the UK from Ukraine with Ukrainian passports, and then they faded away into Europe. Ukraine was used as a playground against the Western countries. We had to renew the trust to prove there were changes, and we were preventing similar things again with leaked Russian information. It was when we asked our partners to support us by giving us new opportunities for training our staff and security measures. It gave results, and the SBU and Ukraine's secret service 
regained its capabilities. Later, that trust passed to the Defence Intelligence, where I was appointed. The most exciting cooperation happened when I was the head of Defence Intelligence. We also joined operations in cooperation with British and Dutch secret services, which the New York Times journalist mentioned. Thanks to this cooperation, there was a training for the operatives, which later became Unit 2245. Among these officers, there was a man known and respected worldwide, Kirilla Budanov. You were the head of defense intelligence. Can you remember if he was very different from the others? Could you tell me more about him when he was part of Unit 2245? I would like to say that the selection process of the recruits for the intelligence is complicated. Usually these guys are very well prepared physically, mentally, intellectually. However, to become a general, you need to stand out. Budanov, with no doubts, can achieve the set task, and go further and learn how to do the assignment best. Back then there was already a vision, not just of operatives, but like a person who is ready to show new opportunities and go further. That's why he was in the Crimean operation. When President Poroshenko was awarding these guys, he asked if somebody tried to arrest them wearing Russian military uniforms. They replied that no one would arrest us, because we agreed, if someone among us was wounded, that that person wouldn't be taken alive. If someone were killed, they would have left the grenade on his face, preventing further identification. The youngest among these guys was 22, and he was asked what the worst was for him. He had just met a girl and fallen in love. On the way back, they had to swim for more than six hours holding a grenade. If Russia tried to catch him, he would have blown himself and them. He was not going to stay alive if things went wrong. The worst would have been if that girl had never found out what happened to him. I have to say he is alive and happily married. I would like to send him greetings. It was military luck and God loves Ukraine. I think the information about the poisoning of Mrs. Budanova started from you. What's going on with it? Is there an investigation? How serious was it? Do you know any new details and facts by now? Я скажу для наших телеглядачів наступне, що Кирило Буданов, можливо, сьогодні залишається після президента I would like to explain to the viewers that Budanov, after the president, stays the most desirable target for the Russian secret service. Budanov opened the second front line. The first drones to Russia took off from the island where Defence Intelligence Headquarters is based. Today, the island is planning operations targeting two to three gas and oil plants that are blowing up in Russia. That's why Budanov is a challenge for the Putin regime. That's why they are hunting after him. What happened to his wife is not an accident. The test showed the presence of heavy metals in her body, mercury and arsenic. There were a few officers of the defence intelligence poisoned. As far as I know, the GRU particular unit does the poisoning ops. General Avayanov is in charge. He is the deputy head of the Russian GRU. This general was responsible for the operation using these poisons in the West. Посаду заступника російського гру, і саме цей генерал відповідав в тому числі за операцію з використанням таких отрут на заході. І західним спецслужбам сьогодні відомо про такі операції. Western Secret Services are aware of these operations. The investigation carries on. The representatives of Bellingcat also expressed their interest in investigating the activity of this unit after the poisonings and offered their help. Причетності цього спецпідрозділу російського гру 
до цього випадку і запропонувала свою допомогу. How is her recovery? Її відновлення. А пані Буданова сьогодні почувається себе добре. Mrs. Budanova is doing well today. She has completely recovered together with other guys and two officers. She is safe and sound. Що не загрожує? Cooperation with CIA in this uh, the New York Times article was mentioned. The result of the productive cooperation is 12 stations in Ukraine for у нас що в Україні зараз є 12 пунктів для це не пункти. Я відразу хочу поправити, це були просто розвідувальні центри. Саме там ці центри знаходились вдовж кордону з Росією. These are not the stations, I would like to clarify. It is the intelligence centers along the border with Russia. The guys trained with our Western partners help work in these centers. It wasn't only CIA, but also British MI6. These guys were assigned to gather intelligence for operations on Russian territory in the interest of Ukraine and our Western partners. В зв'язку з тим, що зараз вирішується питання фінансування від Америки для України, чи We are waiting for the American senators vote in Congress to support Ukraine. Is there a risk that these centers can be closed? Сьогодні питання не в тому, що закриються пункти. Їх не закриють, тому що вони дійсно сьогодні там продовжують виконувати багато питань саме щодо Today these centers are safe. They won't be closed because they do many things including interceptions, enemy plans, movements and itineraries. The core question is whether there will be possibilities to increase opportunities and support might decline. It is a danger not only for Ukraine but also a question for national security. Один приклад, і коли ми поділилися матеріалами, які ми мали можливості доставати з території України щодо Росії, а і британський I want to share one example. When we gave our partners the intelligence we managed to get about Russia, British and American experts did not at first believe it. They thought that that kind of documents could only be gained in Russia. Ukraine hasn't been considered a country of opportunities. We succeeded in convincing them and proving how interesting it can be to do those things smartly. Their analysts, who received our documents, verified the authenticity and said that better papers about the Russian armed forces weren't available. They hadn't seen them since the Cold War. I was very proud to represent the system I was in charge of. It's a great feeling that the Ukraine Secret Service was recognized as equals among the top services in the world. Гордість, що сьогодні українські спецслужби, вони визнані, їхні спроможності на рівні світових спецслужб. Але ж там дуже тонка лінія між тим, що цією плідною кооперацією і бути неслухняними. Тобто вам перебуваючи There's a fine line between productive cooperation and disobedient partner. You had to choose between successful operation in Russia and being obedient when you were in charge. You choose successful operation on Russian territory and lost your job. Успішної операції на території Росії і внаслідок чого втратили свою посаду? Жень, ну я би Ні? сказав би по-іншому. Насправді ніколи так не розглядалося. Там, бути слухняним, бути неслухняним. А бути українським, скажімо так, генералом. I have never considered being obedient or disobedient to be a Ukrainian general or something else. It is not even an option. I was and always will be serving the Ukrainian people. My priority is the national security of the Ukrainian people. So when we were making those decisions before the start, we knew that Russia would try to occupy some parts of Kherson region, delivering paratroopers by helicopters. We had to stop it in time, to stop all the planes and helicopters before they took off. Of course, we had to prepare those operations. If it was a red line for the Americans, it was their agreements with the Russians, not ours. Тобто знищити весь літаки, там, гелікоптери ще до їхнього виліту. От. І тому, безумовно, для нас було важливості розуміти і готувати такі операції. Те, що це були червоні лінії там, американців, це були їхні домовленості з Росією, а не наші домовленості з Росією. Я пригадую 14 рік, коли всі американські, британські, західні посли мовляли наших високопосадовців не відкривати вогонь в Криму. I remember in 2014, when American, British and Western ambassadors were begging not to open fire in Crimea. 
because they were afraid of the consequences, the beginning of World War III and the start of open conflict. They were not ready to accommodate that number of refugees from Ukraine like it is now. For them, it was better to convince us to stop. But I would like to give you an example of Israel. Do you remember when Ben-Gurion, at the beginning of the Arab-Israeli war, was told not to announce sovereignty? American partners said, you are not ready for it and the Arab world will destroy you. He replied, today it might be early and tomorrow can be too late. I think it depends on people, circumstances and opportunities. Because they agree with the arguments of the Western partners, they were convinced that they would make mistakes like Shakasvili in Georgia in 2008. President Yanukovych was still legitimate, Putin would bring him back on the top of tanks, and then the situation would be even more complicated. We listened to them back then. After the Crimea, Russia invaded the east of Ukraine. The West again didn't believe it was Putin. They needed the evidence, and they wanted us to prove the Russian presence. Our intelligence was the main priority in proving that the Russians were there. It was a massive chunk of work. Скажіть чесно, наскільки реально повернути Крим? Ми бачимо Please be honest. How realistic is it to return Crimea? We see how challenging it is to return every inch of the land on the front line. Of course, we would like to regain Ukraine's territory as in 1991. So, how realistic is it to get it back and how many years do we need for it? The Western politicians' main mistake is that the return always involves weapons. I think that Ukraine's victory is not only getting back our borders, it should also be in the heads of the Kremlin grandpas, for them to realize they should withdraw the troops, get rid of Putin and reset Russia, reset the relationship with the West. That's one of the scenarios of our joint victory with the West. We must work, so it's not always paying a price for the sacrifice, uh, with an enormous number of victims among our service members and citizens. We are ready for it, but there should also be different strategies, and it has the right to life. Україна і Росія після закінчення війни, якими ви їх бачите, і які кроки потрібно зробити, щоб на Ukraine and Russia after the war is over. How do you see these two countries? What kind of steps need to be taken to prevent something similar in the future, minding that Russia has nukes? Western journalists and politicians say there's a fear that if Ukraine has enough weapons to win, then it upsets Putin enough to press the button and send the nukes or provoke chaos in Europe using illegal migrants. Some speculate that Ukraine was given a weapon to defend, but not to win. Щоб вона могла захищатися, а не стільки, щоб вона перемогла. Справді, це ваша правда. Це є питання сьогодні, чому? Тому що Захід ще досі не визначився, що робити з Росією після нашої перемоги. Але без спільної перемоги нам цю перемогу самостійно буде дуже важко отримати. It is true. It makes perfect sense. The West hasn't decided what to do with Russia after our victory. But winning alone will be very difficult. The West should understand that any agreement with Putin is a delayed war today, a postponed war against NATO and European countries. So today, they can have war by means of supplying ammunition, and it's nothing compared to the price Ukraine pays. Otherwise, they will need to fight themselves. If they understand, the Western leaders and partners, that Ukraine's victory will be a mutual victory and anything else will lead to the postponed war. There are speculations that President Biden is afraid of the nuclear war. 
There was the experience with Saddam Hussein, the dictator was removed, but it didn't solve the Iraq problem. A similar situation can happen with Russia. Even if that dictator is removed, some extremists can get hold of their nuclear weapon, then it's a new headache for the West. Тому що екстремістські групи чи навряд чи єдине, що вони там можуть там боятися, що може прийти хтось ще гірший, ніж Путін. Але ми здається, що гірше ніж Путін вже до влади прийти не може. Not really. The extremist groups won't get hold. They might be afraid someone worse than Putin can get the power. I think it can't be worse than Putin. He is a dangerous person who can start World War III against the whole world using nuclear weapons. These attempts today won't solve the problem. It is only strengthening these possibilities because every time it gets something new. Тобто і це питання, от коли сьогодні тоді прогадавши історію Сполучених Штатів вирішили розібратися з Саддамом Хусейном, чому тому що казали, краще ми будемо знати, мати з ним справу. Сьогодні поки він озброєний автоматом Mentioning today the story of how the US was dealing with Saddam Hussein, it made sense when he was holding a machine gun before he could get hold of the nukes. I think today it is also better for sorting it out. For Putin to use the nuclear weapons is a red line, personal. It is a line that will cost him his life. All the fuses will be off. All the secret services will be targeting, aiming to destroy him by all means. Для того, щоб його знищити. Скажіть, наскільки реально після закінчення війни і української перемоги у цій війні ем, забрати в Росію? How realistic is it after Ukraine's victory in this war to eliminate this nuclear weapon blackmail tool from Russia's hands? Перемога ніколи не настане, поки буде режим Путіна при владі. І перемога буде просто, як сказав, відкладена. Victory won't happen while Putin's regime is in Russia and the victory will be postponed. The world only feels safe by resetting Russia's democratization and returning Russia to normal relationships with the West. Now the world should understand that the enemy is not Ukraine. It's not the illusional enemy. It's a real, cynical, horrible enemy who destroys everything around him if it's not his way. This enemy should not get any mercy. От. І цьому ворогу не має бути пощади. Чи слідкуєте ви за новинами? Do you follow the news of the British royal family? Да, я дуже uh, радий сказати, що був вражений, uh, скажімо, там, словами підтримки, висловленої королем Чарльзом на годи uh, з приводу Yes, I was impressed by the support of King Charles on the second anniversary of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I want to express my gratitude to the British people and the leaders of Britain for their enormous support for Ukraine. There's a tale. A little ladybug is carrying a drop of water, and the eagle is asking what it was doing. The ladybug explained that it was trying to stop the fire at her friend's nest. The eagle replied that the nest won't be saved. The ladybug says, you might be right, but everyone will know which side I am on. Вона каже, може і так, але всі будуть знати, на чиєму я боці. Ми дякуємо насправді всім нашим союзникам за допомогу і за підтримку. Всі з найскладніших час вносять для України, а для всього людства. І останнє питання. Я знаю, що... I know you like and watch spy programs and films. Mind in the fact you worked in the secret service. Does the real life James Bond exist? The James Bond. Я хочу сказати, це колективний образ розвідника. Чому? Тому що, ну, там насправді розвідка це поєднання і агентурних, і технічних, і інших можливостей, які сьогодні. It's a collective image of the spy because intelligence is the combination of agents, technical and other opportunities used today in the complex. The primary function is analytics because they can gather all the information, analyze and make conclusions. As for the person who can gain it all, there are stories like these and the role of the personality is vital. I love James Bond films and the British Secret Service MI6 is so famous. Good luck to these guys in their work. Ще одне. Це вже точно останнє. Є, я пам'ятаю, що допомога британських спецслужб. I remember the British Secret Service helping Ukraine fight for independence. 
It has old roots and during the Soviet occupation. Brits supported it till 1954. Це унікальна історія. Я випадково про неї дізнався під час однієї з зустрічей з керівником британської спецслужби, який був в Україні. І тоді Україна якраз сама This is a unique story. I accidentally found out about it during a meeting with the head of the British Secret Service while he was in Ukraine. It was when Ukraine opened the archives and allowed accessing the KGB documents regarding the Ukraine insurgent army. It is the army of unconquered. They tried during the Soviet regime to gain independence. They hoped that Germany promised to help, I mean the fascists. It hasn't worked out. They started to fight against the Red Army and the fascists. І він отримав шалену підтримку населення. І от щоб скомпромувати цей рух, цю, цю боротьбу, тоді КДБ... The resistance movement lasted until 1954 in the western parts of the country. This resistance had enormous support among the locals. So the KGB, to compromise this movement, started to kill the civilians dressed like the representatives of the Ukrainian insurgent army to break the support. So the British colleagues told us they had the archives and shared them with us. It turned out that British intelligence helped this movement fight the Soviet imperial regime. That's possibly why it lasted so long with such support. Soviets couldn't stop the movement of the unconquered. Тоді так, ну, довго при всіх можливостях, от тоді радянської влади, вона не змогла зупинити цей рух нескорених. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Jenny Klochko. You were watching my podcast. And today I talked to Valery Kondratyuk. Please don't forget to comment, like, share and subscribe. Thank you.